I am not Noreen Tomasi, who is the head of the center. I'm Roxana Robinson, and um, here I'm a fiction writer, and I'm here because I'm a big fan of Stewart's. Um, so Noreen asked me to introduce him. You all know who he is, or you wouldn't be here, but I will remind you, he is one of our best short story writers and poets. He grew up in Chicago. He went to the Iowa Writers' Workshop. He's the author of two collections of, of poetry and five collections of short fiction. He has um, been awarded the Lennon Prize, a Penn Malamud Award, a Whiting Award, the Guggenheim F Fellowship, and MacArthur. So the world agrees about his merit. I first re um, ran into Stewart's work when I, when I was invited in 2001 by Ed Hirsch, who is here tonight, the wonderful Ed Hirsch, um, invited me to Houston to teach, and it was the first time I had ever taught a college course. And I wanted the students to read one story, one master story every week, and then they would do exercises every week. So I had to find whatever it was, 18 wonderful short stories that would introduce these young writers to the great writers for, in their field. And one of the stories I chose to my great delight, was called Live from Dreamsville. It's in the collection Sailing with Magellan, and it's a great, great story, and I recommend it. One of the things that characterizes it is um, this sense of enormous vitality and humor and energy. And it's about two young boys who are trying to get to sleep, and they sleep in the same room. They're brothers. And they live in um, a Polish neighborhood, and they listen to the neighbors, and the dogs, and the cats, and their parents. Everybody is sort of in the thick of things. But the great thing about the story is the older brother has this fantasy, which he persuades the younger brother to believe, which is that he has a trap door underneath his quilt. And he goes under the trap, into the trap door underneath his bed, and there is a clubhouse filled with animals that can talk and snacks. <laughs> malted milks and root beers and candy, it's very innocent. And so he goes down there, he goes under the quilt and he tells his brother that he's in Dreamsville and he starts talking to all the animals. He says, hi Whiskers, hi, hi Mousy Brown, how are you? And his brother is livid with rage because he can't get in. The older brother will never let him into Dreamsville. But the younger brother believes it. And in a way that's what all of Stewart's stories do. They open a trap door for us. We totally believe in the world that he creates for us. It's full of talking animals, it's full of treats, um, and it's sublime. It's a place we want to be for the duration of that story. So thank you for that story. Thank you for all your stories. And here's Stuart Devitt. Thank you. Sneaky introduction, and I love that. <laughs> Glad my brother's not here. <laughs> Story pisses him off. <laughs> um, I just thought, given the opportunity and the place, the, the uniqueness of the place, that I wouldn't just read. I would. I understand that one of the k kinds of traditions here is that it draws writers in a city of writers and people just are kind of interested talking about the craft. And uh, I, I really don't usually um, do that because um, I, the audiences are usually mixed. Uh, but So I don't have any uh, prepared remarks, but f please feel free to engage in, in conversation or, or uh, questions or anything that you care to do. Uh, having to do with fiction, because in my, in my kind of vision of this, we're all not writers, but we're, we're, we're people who have real arts. That is, that they come through the body, like music or paint. And we're, we're all sitting here with paint spattered clothes, the, the way a bunch of painters would get together. Um, I, I've got two books, so I, I was trying to think about maybe what to say. Uh, if I was going to talk about this book, Ecstatic Cahoots, 
they've got a lot of overlap with them, actually. If I was going to talk about this one, one of the things that occurred to me to talk about was what are stories? Because for me, it was a real pleasure to mess around with it, to play, to play in the broadest sense of the word, that is, the, the creative sense, the way uh, you play in order to learn something. And um, there's a story in here called The Start of Something. And one of the things I was thinking about as I wrote it is, can you make a story up? That, does the story always have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end? Obviously, these are not original thoughts to me. I'm not claiming they are. But um, at one point, what happens is a guy is driving along the North Shore of Chicago and he sees a, a sale, fancy garage sale. Somebody's died and the relatives are selling off the, the furniture, probably to make the will turn out, right? He buys a pair of trousers and, and he's, he's wearing this pair of trousers coming back from his father's funeral on an airport bus. And um, a woman in a kind of a 20s looking woman <coughs> I don't mean 20 years old, I mean she, she's got a kind of 20s look about her, um, asks him if those are, are the real deal and also notices that they look kind of itchy and he, uh, he says, yeah, I, I, they're probably from the 20s, I bought them at this garage sale, um, the, the mansion that reminded him of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And she says um, at one point in the conversation, I bet it feels good to get them off. <laughs> and um, outside the snow settles on Chicago like a veil as if the same veil of snow that was floating the earth earlier in the day when he boarded the plane in Minneapolis returning from his father's funeral the airline bus is stalled again in traffic she's turned away staring out the window he doesn't know her name, has yet to ask where she's traveling from, if she lives in the city or is only visiting, let alone the facts of her personal life. But all the questions are already in motion between them. Why not end here without answers? Aren't there chance meetings in every life that don't play out? Stories that seem meant to remain ghostly, as faint and fleeting as the reflection of a face on the window of a bus, Beyond her face, snow swirls through the steam from exhausts and manholes. Why not for this one time let beginnings suffice, rather than insist on what's to come, the trip they'll take before they know enough about each other to Italy, those scenes in her apartment when she'll model her finds from vintage clothing stores, fashions from the past, those stripped from her present body. Her name is B. They'll say they were, she'll say they were fated to meet. So, I mean, you, you kind of get that notion that there's, there are these kinds of stories that, that um, the, the prototype for this book was actually called The Story of Mist. It was a, a little 22-page uh, chapbook that friends from Buffalo put out back in the 90s. When I, I'd always wanted to just do a book of these little stories that hover somewhere between what's now called flash fiction what used to be called the short short. But when I was um, first started writing these things, the only people who would publish them were, were, were poetry editors. If they were short enough, they were called prose poems. And it, would, it really struck me over and over again that um, a, a lot of what I was reading as prose poems and happy to read as prose poems seemed a hell of a lot like stories to me. And, but. Um, it was the very fact that they were caught in this kind of limbo between the two genres that, that was fascinating to me. It seemed to me that it was an opportunity to try to forestall reader expect expectation rather than meet it to, to ask the reader to put it in neutral. Um, some of the stories in this book, I had lying around for years, waiting for the end. And then one day, for one reason or another, gave myself permission 
to just publish what I had. And then kind of stood back to see what the reaction to that was. And um, so it, in a way, it, it isn't um, some kind of theoretical stuff. It's just experimenting uh, with yourself and then seeing what that relationship with uh, a reader is going to be. So if I was going to talk about that, oh, well, if, if I was going to, see, you, can't, you can't be too aggressive. <laughs> if I was going to talk about that, uh, the other piece I probably would have read would, would be fiction. I'll just read a little piece of it. But you know, I mean, here's a story named after the medium. The story could have begun with the faint hum of a bee. Is something so arbitrary as a beginning even required? He wants to tell her a story without a beginning, a story that goes through phases like a moon, the telling of which requires the proper spacing of a night sky between each phase. Imagine the words strung out across the darkness and the silent spaces between them as the emptiness that binds a snowfall together, or turns a hundred starlings rising from a wire into a single flock, or countless stars into a constellation. The story of stars, of starlings, the story of falling snow, of words swept up and bound like whirling leaves, or after the leaves have settled, the story of mist, what chance did words have beside the distraction of her body? He wanted to go where language couldn't take him, wanted to listen to her breath break speechless from its cage of parentheses, to travel wordlessly across her skin like that flush that would spread between her nape and breasts. What was that stretch of body called? He wanted a narrative that led to all the places where her body was still undiscovered unclaimed, unnamed, fiction, the lie through which we tell the truth, as Camus famously said, was at once too paradoxical and yet not mysterious enough. A simpler kind of lie was needed, one that didn't turn back upon itself and violate the very meaning of lying. A lie without denouement, epiphany, or escape into revelation a lie that remained elusive. And um, it seems to me that you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by stories that do remain elusive. That you, Poe talked about not ending a story with a meaning but an effect. What was that French term for sure? Frisson. I, I mean, Sometimes for me that seems to be enough of an ending. That is, that the ending is understood on a physical, on a physical level. Wh whatever it be, that shiver, revulsion, uh, just some kind of feeling that the reader f understands how he arrived at, but doesn't necessarily have to understand what it means. But. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the other book. <laughs> How much time do I have? Oh. <coughs> and um, I want to say that um, the, the book's called The Book of Love Stories. I, it's because it's so much easier to say love stories than it is to say a book about erotic stories. And when I say erotic, I mean, the problem with that word is that it's so much broader than love. And yet, it's so close to erotica. This happened to me at a library, which is why I know. <laughs> and, and the two couldn't be farther apart. That is, erotica is some narrow little sub-genre that I suppose hovers at the edge of porn. And the erotic for me is the f what, I, I almost forced that through the green fuse drives the flower, the, that old um, Dylan Thomas line, the, the, the way human beings are like birds and bees. I mean, I'm reduced to cliches there, but... Um, and, and 
So one of the things that interested me when I put the book together was, was um, I, in, in books I've written, I always have, try to have some kind of an interplay. Little short pieces off longer pieces. Um, surreal, fantastic pieces off of realistic pieces. In this book, one of the, the, the epigraph is from Keats. And it's from Keats' uh, Grecian, or great Grecian urn poem. What man pursued, what struggle to escape, what pipes and timbrels, what wild ecstasy. And um, what I tried to do was to, was to play every story off some art form. And kind of what fascinated me is the way we paint about love, make music about love, write about love, uh, how the arts are integrated in, into the way we live life. Um, my dear friend uh, Edward Hirsch is here tonight, and I, I don't know a poet who nails that subject better than, than Eddie does. I mean, many of his favorite poems. And the reason I, I love them is that they're not, they're not academic poems in any way. They're, each and every poem is a poem about how has... God, my brother is here. <laughs> how has this, how has this, how has art affected? <laughs> it's not the one that I did that terrible thing. To. How has art, <laughs> how has art affected um, the, the actual living of life? So I'm going to end with, um, the first piece in the book is called Tosca. Uh, it was a, a gr great happy time in my life when I lived in New York at one time, and one of the things I did was I tried to go to opera uh, every weekend, if I could. And the thing that's always kind of amazed me about opera is how you can have this absolute sublime music, Mozart at his best, coupled to these absolutely inane things so stupid that you couldn't even have them in a soap opera on television. And that, that, that kind of monstrous discordance between uh, libretto and, and, and music uh, kind of fascinated me. And so in this story, I was kind of trying to play around with how do we talk about Eros? How do we talk about um, love? You, know, I, you turn on the radio and that's all you hear. It, it's um, an inescapable main subject, and yet um, there's so many different ways to approach it. So in this story, what happens is that it begins with a kind of a fantastical scene in which a guy is standing in an alley against the mirror, and he's blindfolded in a slip that he's taken off that mirror, a black slip, as he's wearing it like a hood. And a firing squad is about to execute him. And in fact, the story begins, ready, aim. On command, the firing squad aims at the man backed against the full-length mirror. The mirror once hung in a bedroom and is now cracked and propped against the dumpster. Later on in the story, you learn that the firing squad is, seems to be a firing squad that marches from opera to opera. <laughs> um, killing different people. In, in one opera it's Garcia Lorca, and another opera it's... In, in Tosca it's Caravadosi, uh, Tosca's lover, who, um, who writes kind of the... Um, the primary uh, colon of the story, which is, as I am about to die, I've never loved life more. And um, that it, it kind of figures as a chorus through, throughout the entire story. But at some point, at some point, the, um, the story breaks into realism, and the narrator appears and he says, I've had three friends over the course of my life who told me that they were living their lives like an apple. And then each of the three little stories about these friends is told, and I'm going to read you the last one.
A last friend of mine to say he was having, living his life like, like an opera was cold. He said it during a call to wish me happy birthday, one of those confiding phone conversations we'd have after being out of touch. Not unusual for a friendship that went back decades to when we were in high school. 20 years earlier, Cole had beat me in a state finals, setting a high school record for the high hurdles. We were workout buddies the summer between high school and college, which was also the summer I worked downtown at a vintage jazz record shop. Cole would stop by to spin records while I closed up. He'd been named after Coleman Hawkins and could play Hawkins' famous tenor solo from body and soul note for note on the piano. Cole played the organ each Sunday at the Light of Deliverance, one of the oldest African-American churches on the south side. His grandfather was the minister. I closed the record shop and we jogged through downtown to a park with a track by the lake, and after running, we'd swim while the lights of the Gold Coast replaced lingering dust. His grandfather owned a cabin on Deep Lake in northern Michigan, and Cole invited me to fish before he left for Temple on a track scholarship. It was the first of our many fishing trips over the years to come. Cole lived in Detroit now, near the neighborhood of the 67 riots, where he helped establish the charter school that he'd written a book about. He'd spent the last four years as a community organizer, and he was preparing to run for public office when he married Amina, a Liberian professor who had sought political asylum. Body and soul was woven into the recitation of their vows. The wedding party wore dashikis, including me, the only white groomsman. He called on my birthday, our birthdays were days apart, to invite me to Deep Lake to fish one last time. His grandfather had died years earlier and the family had decided to sell the cabin. When I asked how things were going, Cole paused and said, I'm living my life like an opera. I knew he was speaking in code, something so uncharacteristic of him that it caught me by surprise. I waited for him to elaborate before the silence got embarrassing and he changed the subject. We'd always fished after Labor Day when the summer people were gone. By then evenings were cool enough for a jacket. The woods ringing the lake were already rusting, the other cottages shuttered, the silence audible. Outboard engines were prohibited on Deep Lake, although the small trolling motor on the minister's old wooden rowboat was legal. Cold fish walleye, as his grandfather had taught him at night, some nights under the spangle of Milky Way, and others in the path of the moon, but also on nights so dark that out in the middle of the lake you could lose your sense of direction. The night was dark like that. There was no dark light to guide us back, but the tube stereo that had belonged to his grandfather glowed on the screen porch. Cole's grandfather had theories about fishing and music, one of which was that walleyes rose to saxophones. His jazz collection was still there, some of the same albums I'd sold in the record shop when I was 18. We chose ballads by Ben Webster. The notes slurred across the water as I rode out to the deep spot in the middle. Cole lowered the anchor, though it couldn't touch bottom. I cracked the seal on a fifth of Jameson's and passed it to Cole. Tradition demanded that I arrive with a bottle. We'd had a lot of conversations over the years waiting for the fish to bite. I've been staying at the cabin since we last talked, Cole said. What's going on, I asked. Remember I told you I was living life like an opera. You didn't say boo, but I figured you got my meaning, seeing you'd use the phrase yourself. Never know who's listening to him, Cole laughed, as if kidding. But given the surveillance on Martin Luther King Jr., he worried about wiretaps. Cole, I said, I never used that phrase. Where do you think I got it, he asked. Not from me. Maybe you forgot saying it, he said. Maybe you finally forgot who you said it about. Anyway, whoever said it. I'm at a fundraiser in Ann Arbor. Everyone dressed so they can wear running shoes except for a woman I can't help noticing. You know me. Not like I'm looking. Just the opposite. There's always someone on the make if you're looking. She's out of vogue. I hate misogynist rap man to plead guilty to thinking rich bitch. Which I regret when she comes up with my book and a serious camera that can't hide something vulnerable about her. Photojournalist, her card reads. And could she take one of me signing my book and I say, sure, she promises not to steal my soul. And she smiles and asks, 
if she can make a donation to the school? And how could she get involved beyond just giving money? And where's my next talk? Do I have time for a drink? Two weeks later at a conference in D.C., she's there with Wizards tickets. And this time I go. We go to the game. In Boston, it's the symphony. In Philly, I show her places I lived in college, and I take her to the clef for train play. And in New York, we go to the Met. I never been to an opera. We go three nights in a row. Was I happy? Happiness isn't even a question. Remember running a race? 13.79 seconds you've lived for. And when the gun finally fires and you're running, you disappear. Like playing music those few times when you're more the music than you. She could make that happen again. One night I'm home working late, Mina's already asleep, and the phone in my office rings. I'd never given her the unlisted home number. You need to help me, she says. The line goes dead. Phone rings again. Where are you, I ask. Trapped in a car at the edge, she says. Her calls keep getting dropped. Her voice is slurred. Come get me before I'm washed away. I keep asking her, where are you? Finally, she says, Jupiter Beach. I drove to see the hurricane. I say, you're a thousand miles away. Phone goes dead, rings, and Mina asks, who keeps calling this time of night? She's in her nightgown, leaning in the doorway for I don't know how long. Too long for lies. I answer the phone, but no one's there. She have a husband, Mina asks. You gotta call him now. Business card from Ann Arbor has private numbers she listed on the back, one with a Florida area code. The man answers, gives his name, I say, You don't know me, but I'm calling about an emergency. Your wife's in a storm in a car somewhere on Jupiter Beach. I know you, he says. I know you only too well. Don't worry, she doesn't tell me names. I don't ask, but I know you. Me to press a speakerphone. You teach tango, or mandarin, or yoga, or murderers to write poetry, film the accounts of torture victims, rescue greyhounds, and other things you do, the righteous things you say, and I know you couldn't take your eyes off her that first time you saw her, and how that made you realize you'd been living a life in which you'd learned to look away, and like a miracle she's looking back, and you wonder what's the son of a woman like that? Not long after everything's happening so fast, you ask her, what do you want? And she says, to leave the world behind together. And you think beauty like hers must come with the magic to allow you to do things ordinary people couldn't do, places you couldn't go, a life you dreamed when you were young. But now, just as suddenly, she can destroy you by falling from the ledge she's calling from, or falling asleep forever in the hotel room where she's lost count of the pills. She's talking crazy since she stopped taking the meds you never noticed. And when she said she loved you, that was craziness too. You're a symptom of her illness. So you call me, not to save her, but yourself. And it's me who knows where she goes when she gets like this. And I'll go as I do every time to save her, calm and comfort her, bring her home. Because I love her. I was born to I'll always love her. And you're only a shadow. I've learned to ignore shadows. She made you feel alive. Now you're a ghost. Go. Don't call again. I told you on the phone call, said, that I was living my life like an opera. But he's the one who sang the aria. So, has been disrupted. Um, well, that 
in this story, it's the it's the um, extras in the opera who never get to sing, who um, are marching around <laughs> either from opera to opera, apparently down an alley in Chicago, executing uh, people. The um, a story that I kept out of other books is called uh, it is the title story called Paper Lantern, and I, I'd always I, I knew I wanted to write a book of, of love stories, whatever. So I I, did, I mean it, it probably could have been squeezed into some of the other books, but I kept it out. That story, um, all the other most of the stories in the book. Um, there's one story in which there's a kind of an essay on Hemingway and uh, that that plays off of the love story. In another story, it's a B-movie by Kevin Costner that plays off the love story. In this one, it's the opera. And actually, in Paper Lantern, it isn't, um, it's, it's one of the few in there where it's not art playing off the story, it's bogus science. They're creating a time machine. So in a lot of the cases, the story itself is realistic, but the set of imagery that's playing off of it, which is usually from a different art form, is, is where the, the fantastic resides. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you tell the difference between a story that is complete but has no ending and one that is just not finished. Okay. I mean, it's a great question, and it's the risk. You, you, you know, it's, it's a risk that you, you take if you give yourself permission. But um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, the, the question is great. I don't know what the answer is. It, it varies from so many, from story to story, that I, I'm, a, I'm a little shy about generalizing about it. I, I, I'll say this then. You know, the, I mean, the story is such an, is such an artificial, totally human, construct. And it's so strange how wired we are to tell stories. That, I, I, that when you buy them in a book, you think I'm buying a bunch of stories, and sometimes you forget the fact that everything you've told yourself about your life, i.e. memory, is a story that you've made up. And, you know, for instance, my brother and I, if we began to, to tell stories about our home life, We'll tell stories about the same thing, and his story will be different than mine. It, it's happened any number of times, and it's one of the things that makes conversation fun. So, one of the things that a writer can do is take into account, uh, as, as many writers have, the, at different endings to the French Lieutenant's Woman, etc., that, that stories have this malleable quality about them that, that um, that comes from the fact that they're not trees; they don't exist in they don't exist in nature. Um, so th that said, going back to your question, the thing about an ending is that we're our culture tells us what an ending is. An ending doesn't exist. We're told what an ending is. We're convinced what it is. We accept it. We learn what it is. And when I said, for instance, that Poe creates the notion that a story can end in an effect, that changes all writing. As soon as everybody accepts that notion, it changes every kind of story. It, it means now we have that kind of story. When Chekhov comes along and he says a story can be, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to end in everything tied in a knot with a moral like a fable has, etc., etc. Those are all great endings. Chekhov said it can end in a realization. Joyce comes along, or Virginia Woolf, or whoever you want, and says, all right, well, if we have a revela revelation, we can also have an epiphany. So, you know, in other words, but if you think about the names I've just said, you realize that if you could think of a new way for a story to end, you would join that pantheon. <laughs> it sounds simple once it's there, but to actually come up with a new way a story could end means that you're entering that kind of hallowed company. So, um, 
the, the thing about your question is that an ending, of course, isn't detached from the story. The story has to generate the ending. And I think that's where the answer to your question lies. Is the story generating an open-ended, or is the story generating a story that feels like it should be closed on? Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if you talk a little bit about whether you think opera, from that period of your life when you were seeing so many of them, uh, whether you think opera has influenced your life? Well, all music has. <coughs> I mean, if, if given a choice, I'd be up here with a saxophone. <laughs> but if I was, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> if you came, you'd leave. <laughs> so, um, but the, the thing I love about writing, which I'm bringing up only because it, it, it figures in the stuff I tried to say tonight, is that um, stuff I've liked the, the best about writing is when words take me to a nonverbal state. Does that make any sense? I, Elliot had a fancy term for it called an objective correlative. The, you know, the notion being that you you, you could tell a reader at the end of the story, Joe is lonely, and you've only got that one little word, and yet there must be infinite shades of loneliness. And only some kind of an objective correlative, not diction, can take you into that shading. And so the paradox of a verbal art form taking you to a nonverbal place has always fascinated me whether it's an image or whether it's the musicality of language or some combination of the two. I mean, that, that old cliche, an image is worth a thousand words, applies when the medium is words. And um, so, but, but music for me is, a, you know, the primary example of that, that, that kind of um, emotional thinking is what I, I think of music is, is. Music makes us feel and yet somehow thoughts come out of those feelings. Um, you were talking about, in, in your story fiction, it, it was a blackness that everything was created from, like it, it was a void, almost like a um, like space or like, you know, Malick's Tree of Life or something, it was just total blackness that was created. Um, and it's, it seems like that, that's, that holds for like how I read uh, I Sailed with Magellan, and it seems like you create out of, out of nothing, um, imagery and color out of, out of nothing. And then the last story you read seemed almost like it was painting on a spackled ceiling, that there was more intrusion. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you have to have a total quiet and blankness and blackness to, to work with words? No, I, I, I feel like that blackness is the silence that you need to have music. That is that when you listen to music, you're listening to the notes, but without the silence, those notes are senseless. And so you that it's that interplay. The, the image I was trying to get was, what is a snowfall if you don't have the blankness between the flags? I forgot the magic words. Thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>